Hi, welcome to Pop Culture Maniacs' this podcast. Um, thank you very much for waiting for us. You know it's been a while since we've last recorded one. Um, so, as usual, it's me, Kieran, and with me, Jean. And for this episode, we'll be talking about um, No Time to Die, since, um, well, my podcast, I can do whatever the hell I want. <laughs> so, yes, No Time to, uh, to Die, we're, so, so this is sort of... A, so it's a follow-up from our podcast when we did it with um, Duncan Casey. So, Duncan, if you're listening, hello. Um, and obviously, we come from two different schools. I'm a big Bond fan. You're more, ca- well, not you're more of a casual viewer. Yep. So, so yes. So go for the basic um, plot. Since I think we can, this will be spoiler heavy. I think by now, I think most pe- a lot of people would know of the big twists, but just to, just to warn you, if you haven't, just to warn you that there there will be lots of spoilers. So this one takes uh, no time to die. Takes place five years after the events of um, Spectre. Uh, Bond retired, and uh, an MI six um, facility is raided by a, by the uh, byload of mercenaries working for a villain called Safin, and he ends up having to be called back into action first by Felix Leiter from the CIA and eventually MI6. And plus, he has his own tr- personal problems with Madeline Swan. That's very much, a, very much a very quick way of putting the plot. So, Jean, do you want to start with your basic thoughts? Ah, uh, sure. Um, you know. It was a movie where I, you know, personally, I've only seen now four James Bond films, and out of the Daniel Craig over, I've only seen Casino Royale, um, Skyfall, and now No Time to Die. And uh, my big takeaway is that I really wish I'd watched Spectre before. Um, I was pretty confused um, when it came to a couple of the key characters. Um, I had no context of who Madeline was. Um, I had no idea um, who Christoph Waltz was playing. And in fact, uh, that, that, you know, there's a lot of talk about him being James Bond's brother. And as one of the, the key plot points of the story is that there's these microbial, you know, things that can attach to DNA and then kill family members. So when that whole thing went down with, with Blofeld and... Bond, I spent time trying to figure out how Bond wasn't dead and till it was only until Q mentioned that they're not actually related that I was like, oh, okay, they're not actually related. So I was very confused with a lot of the callback characters to Spectre, which kind of took me out of you know certain sections of the film. But, you know, that being said, you know, the, the early stuff with Jeffrey Wright's character and, and that element was really powerful to me because I particularly love that character in Casino Royale. And, you know, the, the final climax and everything, I mean, it was fine. It did what it needed to do. It did what I expected it to do. Um, I just didn't really feel the big emotional arcs the way somebody who was very invested in Daniel Craig's run as Bond probably would have. Um, I found the story really long I think they could have chopped out a solid half hour and been fine. Um, but, you know, to me, it was fine. It wasn't particularly great. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. Um, I just wish I had a, a better understanding of the history of the character within this run to really connect to some of the points. Uh, I would say that is a very interesting experience to watch it without seeing Spectre because um, it had to um, it had to follow up on the plot points of Spectre despite the fact that Spectre is probably w- one of the least like Bond films um, so yes um, so for me I am very conflicted about the film I my review when I wrote it was sort of I would say modestly positive but there are because but some of the reviews have been absolutely glowing for it. So, like, pe- like people like the Guardian and uh, Mark Camo from the uh, BBC, the BBC, absolutely loved it. Uh, but I think the the reaction from fans has been much more mixed. So, 
our friend um, Duncan Casey. He he was quite positive, whilst um, someone like um, like Calvin they, uh, uh, sorry, someone like Calvin Dyson, who's a big Bond fan on YouTube, his, his review was much more mixed, and I would say my opinion more aligns with Calvin's rather than Duncan's. Obviously, I think probably the most bombastic film from Dan. Your Craig's one. This felt much more like they're trying to go emulate more like something out of the Roger Moore era in its scale and plot because you know this is a plot involving bio, uh, nanobots that can uh, be used to target individuals. That you know, you know it's all a villain with uh, his own poison garden, and it's all. You know, it's going much more into sci-fi territory, and I think when Bond goes into sci-fi, it is pretty, um, it is pretty dangerous for it because something like Die Another Day was hated because it was so <laughs> leaning into sci-fi. Yeah, I just it felt so complicated, you know, and and the idea of of Safin being in love with Madeline from the like, like I really was very confused and didn't quite understand where they were going with that um it just it was all weird yeah. with particularly the age difference between them but then there's like no age difference when they're adults i don't know what's going on there yeah so i was gonna say because um yeah so there meant there should be like at least a 20 year age difference between them in in the film but in real life the age difference between uh between the actors is only about four years and someone like i mean malik he's quite a youthful looking 40 year old as well Oh, yeah, and, and Leah Sadu is also very youthful looking. So it was just, was, it was so, I just couldn't quite figure it out. And then the nanobots got very confusing for me too, because it seemed almost like, you know, you brought in Q to be like, oh, nope, that's not how they work. Here's how they work. And it just, it felt weird. It felt like they, yeah, it felt more sci fi and not like a, a spy film. Yeah, well, I, I wrote in my review, it felt more like something like a, a Fast and Furious film or something like a Marvel or DC film with some of the things they had. Like you had like the henchman with a um, robotic, uh, with a bionic eye, and which, you know, obviously they have had henchmen, so they've had certain quirks before, but they've always been sort of, yeah, if, it's, if you compare, say, this film to something like Casino Royale or Skyfall, they look like they're in a different in a different universe. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, to, to me, Casino Royale was kind of the most. I mean, it wasn't simplistic, but the most you know simple storyline. It wasn't overly complicated. You knew what you were getting, and Skyfall was a bit more complex because you had to understand the character relationships to really get what was happening on an emotional level. But this, it felt, you know, this movie really is broken into like five set pieces. And I'd say probably two of the five worked really well. And then the other three were, it, it were too much on the nanobots and the, you know, all that. It just was a lot. Yeah, and also with it comes to the nanobot plot, because I think, with Safin, I get his plot with wanting revenge against Spectre, since obviously they were the ones that um, they tried to kill his family and left him um, scarred. It's like, what was his plan after that? Because I guess he's got nanobots. He was going to do something. It didn't actually. They didn't actually explain what his plan was and why he wanted to use nanobots to say kill a lot of people. Yeah, that was weird to me too. Is yeah, he kills Spectre and it makes all oh, Spectre and it makes sense because like you said, he wants revenge. And then what? Then he wants to force Madeline to stay with him. He wants world domination. He wants to destroy the world. I, you know, for all his grandstanding and strange affectations, he never really got around to just explaining exactly what he wanted. Yeah. Yeah, he felt like a really underwritten character. I think Rami Merrick right, was doing his best with the character. I think I don't I don't fault him. I think it was the writing that let let the character down. Yeah, and he was just kind of one note in a way. I mean, 
I felt that way about a number of the characters. Like, um, we haven't talked about it yet, but when Ana de Marmos showed up for that one piece in Cuba, yeah, she was engaging and interesting, and I would have loved to have had her for the rest of the film. Yeah, you know, so, but she disappears. I know, I so was I. I think it was more Daniel Craig just wanted her in the film because obviously they worked together on Knives Out. She was, she is great. I love love her as an actress. <laughs> And, and she was that, fun too in it. Like yeah. she wasn't super serious. She, she and she was clearly capable, and it worked. It worked really well. And that whole sequence had um Phoebe Waller Bridge's handiwork and the dialogue yeah. all over it. But I just I really was excited about that. And then she just disappears and she never comes back. I know. If they if they do like make a spin off, I think she's the character I'd rather have a spin off of. Oh, for sure. I would love to watch her doing spy things in Latin America. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And because um, obviously one of the big selling points was, oh, was it the son of Lynch as um, Naomi? Uh, yes. Yes. Because they obviously were advertising her quite heavily and obviously like, you know, the big controversy from a certain set that she's actually a double, she's the new 007. Yeah, yeah gonna... and just, you know, I thought she did a great job with what she was given. She just wasn't given much. And I the whole making her 007 really didn't matter. She could have been any 00 agent and it would have been just fine. Yeah. And it's just all the dialogue to try to create a animosity between her and Bond, it didn't work. It didn't work. And I think the show or the film would have been much better served if they just made her, you know, double oh eight or whatever and had her with her newfangled ideas up against Bond's traditionalism and have that be the problem. Yeah, yeah. I think they say it didn't really matter that she was double oh seven. The only reason that I think they would have done it is um it's just to prove that double oh seven is a, just the code is the code name, not she she wasn't yet she wasn't James Bond or Jamie, you know, like Jamie Bond or Jane Bond or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, if they just had that and just didn't harp on it for three or four bad jokes. Yeah. I think it would have been perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was some, I think she was pretty cool in the action scene. She is, and she is obviously a pretty good actress. It's just, again, I think it, for a film that was so long, a lot of the a lot of the characters were just underwritten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can. Um, I, yeah, I mean, and we didn't also get time with characters we knew too. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I saw a lot of um, pushback on you know why do we need to put in Numi as a character when you have Money Penny who we know yeah, could have done what, stuff in the field too. Yeah, I felt the same. Like Money Penny did feel like she was pushed off to the side and like. It seems like Naomi uh, Harris just came back because of contractual obligation. Yeah. And uh, I did like that because I need anything because it's Q that, um, not necessarily in the field, but he was obviously a lot closer to the action in the climax. Yeah. And I did love that brief moment where he got to kind of see Q's life too. Yeah. Yeah. Because. it was either be uh, the big reveal is that he was going, he was having a, he was before Bond interrupted his lovely evening, he was going to have a date with another man. Yep, which yeah. you know tracks with Ben Wishaw being yeah. out himself, but you know, it was nice to see you know, a little bit of him. And I mean, yeah. Ben Wishaw's great as Q, like yeah. it's just it, the chemistry with him and Daniel Craig is fun and it, it works really well. Yeah, I also just like they had a Sphinx cat, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That was one of the few jokes that landed the whole, you know, they come with hair now. Yeah. Was, that was a good one. Yeah. It's also because obviously with Bond as well, because, well, I like to think it's a reference to um, Austin Powers, partly, but also because obviously Bond has a history with cats because obviously Blofeld, famous for stroking his white pussy. Yep. Yeah. yeah so, uh, so that was quite fun. Um, now, obviously, I think they wanted to, I think the reason they had obviously of course why Ralph finds us in these films is because obviously he has to be given a more um, meaty role. So obviously he was so he was one that they're raising suspicions first. Was he actually in league with the villains? 
and also because obviously he was him who decided that you know making nanobot technology tolerant nanobet mm. let me get <laughs> i'll get there in the end nanobot technology as an assassination tool which is obviously not a very good idea no i that was another thing i, I enjoyed about the film was that you know yeah he's not the villain but it's very clear that he's made a very very big mistake yeah. and as has the British government, who I assume was behind it all. Yeah. And, you know, I wish the film had forced him to reckon with that a bit more. Yeah. Because yeah. Fines is a great actor. I think he would have done really well. And, you know, outside of that moment where he's sitting and you see a picture of, of Judy Dench in the foreground, and that's kind of like, you know, some guilt level of she never would have done something like this, but look what you've done. I, I wish we could have, you know, really dug into that a bit. But, you know, it's, only a two and a half hour movie, so yeah. you don't have time for that. <laughs> what do I like um, with him? He cause um, Mallory did look a bit more um, pork, porky in this film, didn't he? Like he's well, as Bond mentions, he's drinking a lot, and he does not look like he's in such good shape as he was in, say, Skyfall. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm assuming that was a deliberate choice. I really hope it's not because of Ralph Fiennes is having health issues, but I don't, don't think it, it is. It could have been that, or he could have, you know, a role where he needs to to gain a little weight on it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now, I did find it, I know it's a very minor character, I did find it quite, quite, quite because post the, um, after the post credits sequence, they had the, uh, showed the raid on the MI6 lab, and I thought, because one of the scientists is played by Hugh Dennis, which uh, which took me by surprise, because Hugh Dennis over here is known is known mostly for, as a comedic actor and doing um, panel shows like Mock the Week. So. Yeah, yeah, I I remember him from Taskmaster, and I was yeah. shocked to see. I was like, what? <laughs> What's he in a Bond movie? I know. So perhaps he just had a free weekend, or probably you know one of his friends was involved. But yeah. he did a great job. Yeah, yeah, because obviously he did play the role quite straight. Obviously, I think there was like a little bit of banter, like as in from work colleagues, but that's an, it's not like it was an out and out comedic role. Yeah, no, he did well. It was yeah. it added some levity to the situation yeah. where you knew it was about to go really bad. Yeah, I did like because obviously this was probably the most action well action packed Bond film because obviously you like started with that massive sequence in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, post pre credits then you obviously had the raid on the MI6 lab lab um, Q, um all the stuff in Cuba and then obviously you had the, the other two big set pieces of being one in the forest in Norway and the uh, big really big raid on the uh, on Safin's home in the middle in the old submarine base yep yeah and it's only like you know certainly like it certainly is a massive improvement on Spectre. I think the thing with Spectre, Spectre's action scenes was they were quite um, limp, really. It, it was a massive... It, it, Spectre felt more like a film made out of obligation than out of... Um, uh, than um, wanting to tell a great, great story. Yeah, with this film, I mean, it was clear from the get-go that the goal was to, you know, major spoiler here, kill James Bond. Yeah. Um, so everything was clearly just pushing towards that big moment where he's going to have to make that choice. Yeah. And so you could see that thread throughout. Well, but like then, you said, it just was so action packed that there wasn't much time to breathe yeah. in between those sequences. Yeah, actually, yeah, because um, this film was heavily influenced by On Her Majesty's Secret Service, which is the film famous for being the one where Bond marries and um, his wife dies on their wedding day and i would describe it as with bond he is a character he, he cannot have a happy ending whether it tracy dies vespa dies uh, and obviously in this film the tw the thing is he can't he uh he couldn't be with madeline and his um the other big spoiler his daughter um yep so yeah i so yeah I thought the whole one, because obviously the one, I thought the whole reason why Danny Boyle wasn't um, one 
was kicked off the project because he wanted to kill off Bond and the producer said no. But, <laughs> so yeah, that, that throws that theory out the window. Yep. Yep. It's just, and obviously, you know, like there has been debates on what will happen in the future of the Bond series. I'm sure we will get to that. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. I think that this is the it's the killing off Bond. I think that's the bit that really irks Bond fans. I think it's Bond having a daughter is not such an issue. It's killing Bond off like like that. And I thought surely it's more a case of he lives, but he, he just can't be with his family. That yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not someone for you know killing off characters without good reason, but you know they painted themselves in a corner with this you can't yeah. have bond have a child and you know for all intents and purposes a wife that he can't see because that just changes the whole game for him presuming that there'd be more films with daniel craig you'd be like well what do you do with that they're just out there so he can't just go gallivanting around you know there can't be bond girls with any sort of attraction like it, it hampers the character in a way that would make it difficult to write him and in terms of this it's a clean cut it's a clean break you know, the next James Bond we get, you know, who knows who it'll be, when it'll be, and whether or not he's going to be completely divorced from yeah. any of the characters from this run makes it interesting too. Yeah. Because um, I wrote on Twitter that I described it as that No Time to Die is sort of the Dark Knight Rises of the Bond franchise, partly because of that ending, because obviously Dark Knight Rises ended with Bond sacrifice, uh, not Bond, Batman sacrificing himself though obviously they leave it that little door open that he might have lived which I was not a fan of you you need to make a choice you don't get to hedge your bets like that yeah yeah That's, and it, and as well like um and the sort of comparisons with the Dark Knight Rises I'll go because obviously like you know Batman begins origin story Dark Knight um, being a more of a gritty crime thriller, then uh, then Dark Knight Rises becomes much. More, you, you have hero coming back out of that, coming back into action after a long hiatus. Plus, you the film film having a lot more sci-fi elements than the previous entries, and a lot more villains and yeah. all of that. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I would say that. Um, as well, like like when Mark Commode reviewed it, he did sort of consider it like the horror film, or a horror film in a way. It certainly had like those horror elements because it starts off with um, Safin attacking Madeline and his and her mum's home, mm-hmm. and there are sort of like things that are hard done, almost like a horror film, like um, like when when they meet Blofeld, he's coming up towards him in his uh, big cage. I think there's being described like this Hannibal Lecter moment. Yeah, his Hannibal Lecter cage. That's yeah. what I thought when I saw it. Yeah. I will say this. Um, I did um, love the act because I'm a, I'm a big sucker for action scenes that are done in one take. The bit where he, you know, where Bond's having to fight up the staircase because it's clearly influenced like, by like John Wick, like in those sort of films, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, the hand to hand combat sequences throughout were just great. I love them. Yeah. I know uh, this is a point I should have said earlier, but I have to say that when Miss uh, um, Naomi said to, because like, because uh, she, she, like the, um, the evil scientist who was going like, uh, my, you know, ba- pretty much baited her. And he goes, oh, it's time to die. And I was just like, I want to be like Peter Griffin in that episode of Fab Guy. Oh, she said it. She said it. Yep, that was my take too. I'm like, oh, she got the line. She got yeah. it. Yeah. There have been, um, I think we have to address this issue. There have been some people have considered it the bond gone woke and um, people have been, well, a certain section have been levering, leveling that um, complaint. They're like, one of the stupidest com- uh, is, uh, is the pic- they show a picture of Bond with no no me on the... Um, on the motorbike with her, him behind there you go like he, you're like thinking oh shut the fuck up 
Yeah. My, my take on that is the same. It's been on anytime someone accuses a particular franchise of being woke. It's if yeah. your sense of self is so fragile that it can be changed or hurt by seeing fictional characters that don't look like you, then maybe you should stop watching entertainment. I know. I think I'm of the, I'm just of the view, like quality prevails. If a film's bad, something like the, the 2016 Ghostbusters, it's because the film's bad, not because of, um, not because of gender politics or anything. Yeah. And if, you know, the earlier views of the new Ghostbusters are to be revealed or to be believed it, you know, the new one, which includes all the surviving members of the original Ghostbusters in various moments, might not be as great as you expect it to be either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the quality of a film, you know, you look at something like Black Panther, which is a great, great movie. It shouldn't matter that the cast is black, mostly black actors. Like, come on, you can still watch that movie and enjoy it because it's great. Yeah. That's it. If something's good, it's good. Full stop. If any, I was going to say something like, you know, Mad Max Fury Road. If anything, you could say that was a bait and switch because that's really more of a Furiosa movie. Oh, than, for sure. Than a Mad Max movie. Yeah, exactly. And it's a lot of fun. It's great. It's an excellent action film. It's one of the best movies I've seen. And I'm not a super action person and I could watch that movie every day and be yeah. happy. So yeah, it's, um, some people just try and boil it down to such a simple thing. Yeah, and it, it, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah. Just, you know, watch good things. Yeah. Oh, on a sort of lighter note, what do you think of the Billie Eilish song in the film? So I'm somebody that's never really gotten into Billie Eilish, so the song was fine. Yeah. Um, you know, music's not my jam, so I don't really know all that much about it or her. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was fine. It did its job. Yeah, I would say the same. I was sort of like, because I think when you, when I normally think of Billie Eilish, I think of what's it, um, she sang the song Bad Guy, didn't she? And um, it's sort of much different because obviously if, uh, that sort of song is sort of more electronic, a bit more manipulated. And whilst it was more of a No Time to Die was a more of a soft ballad like song. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the only real Bond song I'm, particularly familiar with is skyfall yeah but you know the song was good the credits were fun it worked yeah so sort of, um again uh, that's all more um a little more influence of on our majesty's secret service because they show britannia um as a part of the um title sequence and she plays a small role in the in, on her majesty's secret services title um car uh, title sequence as well that is something I did not notice. Yeah. So well, you, you never. You, well, you never. Well, you never saw. Uh, you never saw an Honor Majesty Secret Service, have you? I have not. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's usually, as I said, probably one one of the best character driven Bond films. And yeah, so I noticed for like um, I've well, because I on on the website I looked at every single Bond film, even the um, unofficial ones, and. Yeah, on the Majesty's Secret Service kept cropping up in the um, being mentioned in the subsequent articles. Oh. Yeah, well, yeah, that might be one worth watching for me. Then. Yeah, yes, it, it is. It is the oh, the irony is you've got the that's the one where it stars an Australian actor and he's the one that gets to wear a kilt. Well, that's ridiculous. Yes. I know, of course. <laughs> of course, you know, you've got, you've got Sean Connery with his Scottish accent. Get, let, him wear, let him wear a kilt. He should, yeah, he should be in a kilt. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, because, uh, well, uh, well, fun fact here, Ian Fleming, he hated the idea of Sh uh, Sean Connery being Bond at first. He just saw him as nothing more like a glorified stuntman, but then he was one round to the point that he altered Bond's background so that he came from a Scottish background. That's a smart move to make. Yeah, yeah. I think as well, now we've got to talk about the future of the franchise since, um, you know, that ending, it's pretty clear they cannot continue with the series as it is since, well, they technically they could if they did spin-offs. 
but at the end of the credits of No Time to Die, it does say James Bond will return. So, yeah, I think we know what that there will be a James Bond will return in some form. Yeah, I mean, it's too big of a piece of IP to to end it full stop. But yeah, like you said, the question is obviously we've talked in the past about who could play Bond, um, but the other question is, you know, does anybody from this version of the film carry over at all? You know, do we have yeah. the same money, penny, the same Q, the same M, or do we just have a complete clean slate, completely new stories, completely new everything, which might be easier since you've killed James Bond and it appears, you know, it's a different character named James Bond as opposed to just the name James Bond sticking with 007. Yeah. Kind of a deal. So I favor it's going to be this latter. Right? It's going to be a hard reboot with, um, I say, clean slate. So, I think some of those actors as well, they're probably might not be interested in returning anyway, like Ralph Fiennes. Ben Wishel's already said that he he was contracted to do three more and he did three films and he didn't want to do any more after that. So Yeah, and you know, Nomi Harris has more than enough on her plate to yeah. to take up. So yeah, I think I think it'll be interesting to kind of see who we get in the next round, how this is all gonna work out. You know. I you know I'm happy to to watch a new Bond yeah. movie with new characters. As someone who's you know not particularly married to any Bond, any stories, any any anything really, it's it's an interesting thing for me to just kind of check out a new a new group. I would say like because um, when um, cause when Gold and I was was made, there was it was a pretty much a soft reboot anyway because that that was the first one where Judy Dench was M. They sort of they move the locate the setting was more mi6 was set more in Vauxhall cross which is mi6's um headquarters so and obviously quite except for desmond Llewellyn, it was pretty much um coming back it was a clean slate yeah, and i think at this stage of the game too that's probably the best option yeah. I don't want to do an origin story ago because I think oh, no, no, because no, no. I think it would just be Casino Royale over again. I think the other options would be like I was showing Bond when he gets recruited to MI6 or just before he be- becomes du- a double O. But uh, yeah, I, I wrote just... it. Yeah, I yeah. just think that's to be a, a backward step. It's like you say something like you know if you like Doctor Who if they brought back David Tennant to play the Doctor it'd just be a backward step. Mm-hmm. And um, it's also like if they did the origin story, you'll end up probably with another amazing Spider-Man situation. Or even something like, you know, Kingsman, where you yeah. just have to keep going back further and further because you've killed off everybody in the yeah. present. So there's no point in that. Yeah. Oh, I've seen like ideas like people want something like maybe some more book accurate adaptions or, you know, some sort of period spy films. But I think the whole point with Bond is he adapts, he evolves with the time he's in. So, so obviously when Bond started, it was set in the 60s, but uh, uh, he moved into eight, 80s with Roger Moore and uh, Timothy Dalton, 90s with um, Pierce Brosnan, and obviously, um, and obviously with Daniel Craig, it was very much set in its time period of the noughties and uh, 2010s. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for a good, you know, historical film, but it's more interesting to me when you take historical pieces or storylines yeah. and adapt them for today. It's much more interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree on that front. I think if if a, if someone wanted to make an historical action, um, more historical spy film, just make it your own up, make an original idea. It's not like yes, a, yes. And it's not like uh, you know, tie. Obviously, you can't obviously use the name James Bond or anything. Like, there's nothing. It's not like they got copyright on like gadgets, you know, a a quartermaster or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, look at how successful *Knives Out* was to, yeah. to pull another Daniel Craig film. It's essentially at its heart a riff on an Agatha Christie kind of mystery. Yeah. But you know, you can create your own stories, and you can create your own crazy spy stuff. It's fine. People will go see it if it's good. Yeah. Yeah. 
going back to No Time to Die, it could be a case of like it be one of these Bond films where it might take a few years for um for for everything to settle down because on a, when On Her Majesty's Secret Service was released, the reaction was not very positive. It actually took quite a few years for it to get the due it deserved. And I know, remember like seeing like reviews for like Spectre, there were some like really positive reviews when that came out. And I think now a lot of people would just like forget that it exists. Not if you want to understand this movie, you <laughs> can't forget that. it exists. Not oh, true, true. Um, but then, uh, and obviously, I, when I went into review uh, to review it, I had to try and make sure I didn't suffer from fan blindness because there is that risk when you're a fan. Yeah, I mean, for its legacy, I think when people look back, you know, twenty years from now, they're going to look back at the whole set of five because yeah. I think, you know, it's the first, from my understanding, it's the first set of Bond films where. You, they're they're a unit they all work together they're all interlocking yeah. and i think people are going to say you know like what people say with the the old star trek films like you know the the odd ones are the good ones and the even ones are kind of weak or that kind of thing where no, you it's know, the opposite it's the opposite way around isn't it with the star trek films yeah exactly that yeah because the, yeah. the odd ones are not great at all yeah. but yeah the, the idea is like well you're gonna have to watch you know specter to understand how it all ends but you know yeah one three are great and then two's eh, but four is a mess but then you know you get to five and it all kind of ties together so if that's where i think that's how it's going to be talked about in the future yeah yeah probably i agree with you probably it's going to take like a good probably 10 years for everything to settle down i think as well like uh when it comes to sort of uh, bond films because sort of like sometimes the the previous Bond beforehand is not looked so fondly on like I mean with Pierce Brosnan and his ear is being sort of is looked down upon now but then when Pierce Brosnan was Bond it was like Roger Moore was looked down upon and so it might be a case that we might end up getting that sort of thing with Daniel Craig might then the rear people would say oh maybe Daniel Craig wasn't as good as we thought he was at the time and then and then you'll then because you know you get that sort of a contrarian viewpoint and i think a lot of of that is going to be what does daniel craig do next yeah. you know how does the rest of his career shape up if he you know goes on to win a couple oscars and all that they'll be like hmm you know maybe those bonds weren't you know his strongest work but it's part of it's part of his whole backstory like but that kind of thing and if he kind of falls off the face of the earth and, and doesn't really do much then you know that'll yeah. probably impact it as well because I could argue that's kind of what happened with um, Roger Moore and uh, well, definitely George Lazenby because he was never a particularly good actor. He sort of he fluked his way into becoming club coming Bond, and Roger Moore, shall we say, is I think when if you ask what he what did he do outside of Bond, I think people only say the Saint. Yeah, yeah, that that's it. Yeah, was. Well, well, Sean Connery, obviously big star, Timothy Dolan, respected actor, and uh, Pierce Brosnan, and sort of, he gets work. Yeah, you know, with Pierce Brosnan, I think he needs to embrace character actor side of him now, and I think I think that'll help him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, he is. He's about seven. He's nearly seventy now, isn't he? He's got time. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I think we should um, wrap it up with um, uh, since I think we covered quite a lot with No Time to Die. Uh, obviously, listeners, hope you enjoyed. Let us know your thoughts on what you thought on No Time to Die, and we'll be speak to you again soon. Cheers. Bye.